In the book of Daniel, there's a mysterious phrase called the daily. This phrase is often used in conjunction with the abomination of desolation. And in our English Bibles, the word sacrifice, so the daily sacrifice, has been added. But the original meaning of this word has been hotly debated. And so the question is, was this a translation error? And more importantly, what does it mean for our understanding of the end times? That's up next on The Dance of Life. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dance of Life podcast. My name is Tudor Alexander. I'm your host on this beautiful day. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and so I hope you have a relationship with him. And I hope you've also been enjoying our end time series. We're really starting to dive deep into the book of Daniel. Now, last week we did a pretty deep dive into the abomination of desolation. And before that, we looked at the 70 weeks of Daniel. So if you're just joining us, I would highly recommend going and listening or watching to those previous episodes because we really have shifted gears. The first 10 episodes or so of this series have been focused on the millennial kingdom and everything surrounding the millennial kingdom. That was a very big point of debate and division in various end times views is when is the millennial kingdom? What is the millennial kingdom? And so we hopefully answered that question throughout all those episodes on the nature of the promises to Abraham, whether Satan is bound or not, whether Jesus is king right now or in the future, uh, if there's a pre-tribulation rapture or not, all these different things that we looked at. And scripture and history prove to be pretty conclusive that we are actually in the millennial kingdom right now. This is a spiritual reality where Christ is ruling in heaven amidst his enemy, enem enemies, if I can say that word right, enemies. And ultimately the last enemy to be destroyed is death when he returns and everyone is resurrected. And so there is no future physical millennial reign. There's just eternity. And so this idea of Christ being king in the future, of Satan being bound in the future, it's all really connected to larger deceptions. And we started to explore some of those deceptions with the third temple and how everybody's eyes are being placed physically on physical things that are happening, what's happening in Israel, when in reality we should be looking at spiritual things and those spiritual things involve deeper, more sinister realities. And we started to explore those realities last week, which is the abomination of desolation, which is looking at what has made in history, what has really made the, the sanctuary, which is representative. Remember, everything in the Old Testament was a type for the New Testament. With that in mind, the sanctuary, everything pointed to Christ and the plan of salvation, but the sanctuary in the Old Testament was pointing to the plan of salvation, entering through the door. There was only one door into the sanctuary. There was the laver where you would wash away your sins, like being born again and getting baptized. You would put your hands on the lamb and you'd confess your sins. You would repent. Then the lamb would get burned, would get sacrificed for you to atone for your sins. All these things were physical realities that happened, but they were pointing to greater spiritual truths, which is the plan of salvation. Now, the question is, when Daniel was talking about the abomination of desolation in connection to the sanctuary, if you recall, that prophecy, and we'll review it again a little bit today, but today is a slightly different focus. That prophecy was a 2,300-year prophecy. And so, obviously, it's not talking about the physical sanctuary because the physical sanctuary became irrelevant once Christ atoned for sins on the cross, the sacrificial system was over and the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And so obviously it's not talking about the physical sanctuary. And, and again, remember all these time prophecies based on the 70 weeks of Daniel, they're all day to year principle. They're not literal as dispensationalism is reading them as a future 70th week or three and a half years, the Antichrist is going to come. All these things are false theologies, and they were created by a certain group of people to act as counterintelligence because people in the Reformation, all the reformers recognized who the real Antichrist power on the earth is. And so what we believe today, the majority of people, what they believe today is a product of the counter-Reformation. And that's something you should look into if you have never heard of that before. But look into it and see what you find out. But hopefully throughout this series, we will help shine some light on that because ultimately we are living in the climax of that counter-reformation. We're living in the climax and that means that the greatest deception is about to be played on the earth. And who knows, is that, is that going to be a false millennial reign with a false Christ? 
I don't know. The second century Christians who wrote the Didact certainly believed something along those lines. I think it's very likely. At the very least, we're going to see the return of a church, a church state union, the beast. We'll cover all this stuff in the future, but if you were with me last episode with the abomination of desolation and how the papacy, which is the political religio power that has been throughout the last, you know, 12, 1500 years, whatever it's been, that power has made the sanctuary desolate, has set up itself in between God and man, proclaims to be God, proclaims to forgive sins, has made the plan of salvation desolate, meaning empty. People do not go through the door because they're trying to go through the church and through works. They've turned everything upside down and made it into a, a fleshly system instead of being born again and washing yourself in the labor. Spiritually, you get baptized as an infant when you can't even make a an appeal to a clear conscience to God. You, instead of eating from the body and blood of Christ in a spiritual sense, like you're feeding on the word, you're partaking of the Lord's table. And if you remember, the Lord's table is a synonym for the kingdom of God, which is the church, the temple, the body of Christ. All these things are the same thing, really just describing union with God and communion with him. So that's what it means to partake of the Lord's table and to eat the body and blood of Christ. And so they've taken that and turned it into a physical thing where they're sacrificing Jesus every day on the altar at a mass, or not every day, but every Sunday. And they've changed times and laws. We'll get into all this stuff, but they have made the papacy, the institution, not Catholics, but the institution that has set itself up as the abomination of desolation, that has made the plan of salvation desolate. That's what we really talked about last episode. So if you didn't see that, I highly recommend it. Go and check it out. It's going to be eye-opening. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. But today we're talking about Something in connection to this abomination of desolation, and it's really important. It's a topic that a lot of people don't talk about because it's it's a little obscure and it's easily missed. And so we're talking about something called the daily. Now, the daily is a phrase that appears in the book of Daniel in connection to the abomination of desolation. And the reason we call it the daily is because you'll see pretty soon what I mean. But in the phrasing in English... The word sacrifice has been added. So in English, it says the daily sacrifice was taken away. But in the original language, it's not the daily sacrifice. Sacrifice was inferred. The daily, it just says the daily was taken away, the continual, right? So we're going to look at this phrase because it's actually very important to our understanding of the end times. Again, it's something a little obscure, but understanding It can really help, again, solidify your views of the end times and prevent you from being deceived by all of these literal fleshly interpretations that are so popular today, like dispensationalism. But anyway, sacrifice was added, and so this this whole phrase is mentioned several times, and it's important to understand what it means, because even between the KJV and the ESV and other translations, there's big differences where if you're not aware of this, and you're reading through, again, especially for Bible prophecy, something like the ESV, which I usually trust, often leads to error because the tran- the translators had a particular futurist leaning in their eschatology, meaning in their understanding of the end times. And so when they're translating it, it's it's very precarious because you can be easily fooled if you don't understand what the words actually say. So this is what we're going to be looking at today. And... Remember a couple things before we get into this. The the episode that we talked about, the third temple, I think it was episode number five. All the physical things of the Old Testament, even the apostles all universally recognized that these physical things were just foreshadowing spiritual truths, spiritual realities. The third temple was built by the Messiah. He's the cornerstone. It's a spiritual temple. It is the body of Christ. It is the church, it is the kingdom, it is the union we have with God without any separation. It's the kingdom that can't be destroyed because it has no barriers, it has no walls, it's in human hearts. So all these things, even like circumcision, right? These things were for spiritual realities, to circumcise your heart, meaning to be born again, to soften your heart, to be regenerated. All these things are part of spiritual truths. And so we have to learn to read the Bible with 
Of course, it's a historical book. It, it relays historical truths, and we should always use context. But if you read things, especially Bible prophecy, literally, completely, physically, literally, which is what the devil wants you to do, because he puts your eyes on shiny physical things, like, oh my gosh, a third temple is going to be built that you can see, and then some charming guy is going to walk into that temple and declare himself to be God, and everybody's looking for the third temple, and what's going to happen? Who's going to, who's going to do it? Instead of looking truly at what things like beasts are, beasts are systems, they're governments, they're kingdoms, they're powers, they're political entities. The temple is a spiritual reality. So what political power has entered the temple and proclaimed itself to be God already? Well, we talked about that last episode, and that was the abomination of desolation. And we'll get more and more into that as we go. But remember that the 70 weeks of Daniel proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that all of these prophecies of which the daily is connected to, the abomination of desolation is connected to, all these prophecies are ultimately connected to a greater 2,300-year prophecy. Daniel was given the, the prophecy of 2,300 years. He didn't understand it. And so then Gabriel came back and gave him like snippets. Okay, out of that 2,300 years, 490 are decreed for your people. These are going to be counted in weeks of years, 70 weeks, seven days per week, meaning a week, a prophetic week is seven years. 70 weeks is 490 years. Now, that was a chunk out of the 2300. There's also other chunks that we won't cover until a little bit later in the series, like the 1260-day time period, which is reflected in Revelation. And again, if you read Daniel, then you'll understand Revelation. A lot of people don't read Daniel. They just look at Revelation and they read it literally. It's a very poor way to do it because that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. Because then you'll miss, you'll miss the whole truth behind these, these wonderful prophecies. You'll miss the whole point. So, let's get to it. The text starts in Daniel 8, and we see this conflict between the little horn power, which, again, just a little bit of history. Daniel received a vision of various beasts. These are kingdoms and empires coming, you know, through various times. And the little horn power is the final power, basically, the final iteration of this Babylonian system. You had Babylon, you had Persia, you had the Greeks, you had the Romans, and then from the Romans, which were represent, represented by this terrible beast, uh, and we'll talk about these beasts more in detail in a future episode, but now I'm just kind of glossing over them. But out of the Roman system, the terrible beast, came this little horn power, okay? And again, we'll, we'll cover more of this in future episodes, but just for context, basically, this little horn is now what we're talking about. So if we go to the text, it's Daniel 8, uh, chapter 11 through 14. This is where the daily is mentioned first. Verse 11. Yeah, he magnified himself. Now, again, I'm using KJV here. And if you're listening to this, if you open your KJV to these verses, you'll see some words that are italicized. This is very important because the italicized words are the ones that are added. They're not part of the original language. And so that's very important because if you go to the ESV, they don't do that. And so you don't really get a sense of, well, this was added and this wasn't. So again, just another point of discernment. But verse 11, yeah, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. This is the little horn power that's magnifying himself. And by him, the daily sacrifice is added, was taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. It's the place of the prince of the host. Who's the prince of the host? That's Jesus. His sanctuary was cast down, and the abomination of the desolation was put in place because of the little horn. Verse 12, And a host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint uh, said unto the certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily? and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trotted underfoot. And he said to me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So this vision about the daily, the abomination of desolation, the little horn power, trotting the sanctuary, right, casting the truth to the ground, this is a very long period of time. 
And as we go in future episodes, you'll see exactly how that is fulfilled in history. It's pretty fascinating uh, because the papacy was in power for over 1260 years. And that's exactly a match for what Daniel prophesied. And it will come back to power. It's already doing so, but that's a topic for another time. The point is this. If you look in, for example, in the ESV, let's look at this first. So some of these things are worthy uh, of comparison. It, it became, this is verse 11. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him. And the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. It's hard to tell what this is talking about. Like who, the regular burnt offering was taken away from who? The prince of the host? Jesus can't offer regular burnt offerings anymore. You see, it's very confusing with the way they translate it. Now they do get this right. They say regular, the regular. That's what KJV translates as the daily. Because what happens is this word, the daily, the original language, if you go to the uh, concordance, where is it? Okay. It's H8548. It's Tamid is the word. Now this word means a lot of different things. It can mean uh, continual, continuance, constantly, regular, daily, continue, perpetual. So it, it just, the, the challenge here is it means something continual. The question is, what does it mean? This is the mystery behind this phrase, and we'll, we'll unpack it today. But in the next place that this is mentioned, another example would be Daniel 11. And this is about the king of the north, and also Daniel 12, where this is the final chapter in Daniel, and it talks about the daily being taken away and the abomination of desolation being set up. So it gives us a time marker where Something is happening at the same time. The daily is being taken away and the abomination of desolation is being set up. So if we look in Daniel 11, now this is about um, the king of the north. And we'll talk, we're going to spend an entire episode on this. It's probably going to be a long episode because there's so much fascinating things to talk about and how it relates to the things that are happening today. And probably not a lot of people are talking about it in this way because they don't see, they're looking for physical things to be happening, individuals rather than kingdoms and political powers, spiritual realities. They're looking instead for the physical fleshly things because most people's end times views today are influenced by dispensationalism and futurism, which if you recall, were created by the Jesuits during the counter-reformation to take attention off of the real antichrist power, which is the papacy in Rome. But Daniel 11 verse 31 and arms shall stand on his part. There you go, that, that whole point about getting armies. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily. Again, sacrifice is added. So we just say the daily. And they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now, if we look in Daniel 12, verses 9 through 11, it says, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Another indication, by the way, that preterism is wrong. Well, we'll get back to that. Because this is about the end times. It's about the very end of the world. It's not about, you know, something that happened during Daniel's life or even 70 AD. Verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So now we have more time stamps that are happening. From the time that the daily is taken up and the abomination is put in its place, there's going to be a, a time period where what is happening during that time period? Well, verse 10 tells us many are going to be purified and made white, meaning martyred and tried, persecuted, purified through suffering. There's going to be this time period of 1,290 days. And again, we'll unpack all this in the future. But if you recall this 1,290 day prophecy, this is still connected to the 2,300 year. It's the, the 2,300 year prophecy is the overarching umbrella. Under that prophecy, we have, you know, the, the 490 years, the Messiah prophecy from Daniel's time until the Messiah approximately. Then you have later after that, these periods of time where the sanctuary, which is really the plan of salvation, is being trodden underfoot by this power, this little horn power. 
that set himself up, set up the abomination of desolation. He's, he's throwing truth to the ground. He's persecuting the saints for 1290 years. Well, obviously it's not Rome. It's not talking about 70 AD, what happened in three and a half years between 66 and 70 AD. It's talking about a very large period of time where this is happening. And we know that after Jesus, it was the church. That was the new reality. Everybody's being saved through the gospel. There is no separate plan of salvation. So the saints being trotted down are believers. And the question is, what power matches these characteristics in history? And it's very clear if you know your history. And we'll look into that. But the main thing is this. This is proof about the end. Okay, so when preterism says that, oh, this was Antiochus Epiphanes in 160 BC or whatever, they came in and defiled the, the sanctuary and put a Roman standard in there. Or if it was Titus who came in 780 and put their Roman standard. That was the abomination of desolation. Again, these are physical things. The, the temple was already desolate. It was useless because Christ had atoned for sins. The, the veil tore in two. That's about as obvious as you can get. And so that's not what this is talking about. Now, those things physically happened, but they're foreshadowing, and, and Christ warned about the physical reality of, of Rome destroying Jerusalem and the temple so that the believers who would be alive at that time could escape. But within that was also a prophetic reality for something much more significant in the end of days. As you can clearly see that Daniel is not talking about Rome in 70 AD, but the end times, the very end times, which we are living in today. And so this is proof that it's about the end, and it's also proof that the historic way of looking at prophecy, meaning through the day-year principle, not through the literal way, as in literally 1290 days, the historic way is the correct way. And the more we go through this series, now that we've gotten into the book of Daniel, you're going to find out just how correct that is. If you were there for the 70 weeks episode, I know it was a longer episode, but I, again, I wanted to do everything in one episode because it's, it's very detail intensive and I don't want to split it up. I want it to just be a resource for you, but you could see very clearly how the prophecy of the 70 weeks, which is really 490 years, was exact by the year, from the year that the prophecy started to the year that Christ began his ministry, to his crucifixion, to uh, the stoning of Stephen, it was all predicted. And what's interesting, I didn't mention this in that, in that episode, but there's actually other records too. Like for example, uh, in China, 31 AD, which is the date of the crucifixion, there's some fascinating research that found basically records of Emperor Han Wu, I believe. I forget the exact name right now, but 31 AD, they were already recording things about, they didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't know the gospel. And yet the sages, the people who were, you know, astronomers, astrologers, diviners, whatever, the, the, the king's advisors recorded that there was an eclipse and the meaning they got from these astral signs was that the pardon had been proclaimed throughout the world. You can look this up. Pardon had been proclaimed throughout the world and that one man has taken it that the world sent upon his shoulders. Now you tell me like, what are the odds of that being, you know, 31 AD? Well, there are no odds because that was prophecy being fulfilled, even being confirmed by extra biblical sources. And so everything points to this historical understanding of prophecy. And if the 70 weeks is that exact, and it's part of the 2300 day prophecy, then obviously it's 2300 years. And when it says 1290 days after the abomination of desolation is set up and the daily is taken away, it's saying 1290 years. So that's really, really important. That's the first thing to understand. Now, the next thing to understand is what this daily is. So a couple other details we can get are that, okay, so it was taken away while, at the same time that the abomination was set up. So these two things are related in time. We also know that the daily was taken away by armies working for the little horn. We know that from Daniel 8 verse 12, where he says a host was given to him against the daily. So an army was given to the little horn against the daily. 
by reason of transgression. Now this is a, this is, this is seemingly a confusing sentence. Like it's what does this actually mean? And it's it's kind of takes some digging to in context and in history to understand what this means. And we'll get back to it. But an army was given to the little horn against this daily, this continual thing, because of transgression. Now, I want to point something out to you. Every beast that existed, right, beasts are political systems, kingdoms, so Daniel had a vision of four beasts, and then the little horn was kind of the fifth power. Every beast arose and then was eaten, conquered, destroyed by the next beast. Why? Because God was using the next kingdom to judge the previous one. Babylon had its heyday, and then it was judged by the Persians. Then the Persians had their heyday. Of course, they committed their own sins. And then the Greeks took over and judged them accordingly. Then the Romans came and judged them. And then, of course, the Romans had their own judgment too. And that's, a, that's actually recorded in many places, not just Daniel, especially Revelation, when we look at things like the trumpets, uh, the seven trumpets of Revelation. But every kingdom had its heyday, and because God is just, he's going to bring justice on them for their sins. And so an army was given to this little horn power, which is the final power, which came out of the Roman system. An army was given to him against this daily by reason of transgression. So that to me speaks of this continual pattern we see where God is bringing up a power, allowing it to exist so that he can cast judgment on the previous power. So just keep that in mind. Now in Daniel 11 verse 31, uh, we also see the same thing. An arm shall stand on his part and it shall pollute the sanctuary of sin. Now this, in this case, the arms that are part of the king of the north, it's, again, it's all really the same thing. Once you really kind of read through this and see the parallels, it's all pointing to the same reality. But in this case, the arms and the powers are helping this power, this little horn power, this king of the north, whatever's happening, is trotting the saints. It's polluting the sanctuary of strength. It's more directed towards uh, the believers, right? So in one case, it's directed towards whatever the daily is. In other cases, it's directed towards the believer. Now, they're taken away at the same time. So the daily is taken away while the abomin abomination of desolation is set up. So therefore, this can be pinpointed a little easier. And we know that again, from the time that the daily is taken away and the abomination is set up, there's going to be this 1290 day period, which is actually 1290 years, where there are specific things happening to the church. It's being persecuted. It's the truth is being cast to the ground. The, the sanctuary is made desolate, it's polluted of strength. All these things come together now from different parts, but they come together in this picture. Now, if you know your book of Revelation, you know that the woman, which represents the church, is fleeing for 1260 days, which are 1260 years. Do you start to see a pattern? Do you see a pattern with all of these things? And that's why, again, you have to read Daniel and understand Daniel, starting with the 70 weeks, so that all of this other stuff is unlocked. Otherwise, you're going to get lost in the mire of futurism and fleshly interpretations. Now, another thing I want to point out to you is what we talked about last episode, which is the idea that the mystery of iniquity was already at work. So this mystery, this mystery of, of this power that would be in the end times was already at work in various ways through false Christians, false teachers, people who were teaching false gospels. It was already at work. And the reason it was at work is so that the man of sin would be revealed. The, this little horn power would be revealed. And we know that from 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 through 8. Let's read that really quick. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So let's read this in ESV really quick. For the mystery of the laws is already, of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So the 
mystery of iniquity, which we talked about in detail in the last episode. I won't talk about so much here, but first things first, you can't take the Holy Spirit out of the way. That's not, a lot of people think this is talking about the Holy Spirit somehow is restraining something and then he's going to be taken out of the way. That's not who it's talking about because the Holy Spirit can't be taken out of the way. Holy Spirit is omniscient and he's given freely. So the question is, what? who is doing the restraining and who, who is he restraining? This is, this is the thing. And so some people have connected this phrase, this verse, 7 through 8, to the daily. This idea that there's a little horn, there's an army given to him against the daily, the daily gets removed, and the abomination of desolation gets set up. Now Paul is talking about the mystery of iniquity, this future iniquity that's going to come, this mystery. But it's being restrained by whoever's doing the restraining. And so the daily, the conclusion would be that the daily is the restrainer. The daily is the restraining force or power that is holding back this mystery of iniquity at the time of Paul, not not anymore, but at the time of Paul, it was holding back this mystery of iniquity where the lawless one will be revealed, the man of sin. All of this is going to make so much sense. But if you follow me from last episode, if the papacy is the little horn power that arose out of the Roman system, it's a religio-political power that claims itself to be God, that's made the sanctuary, which is the plan of salvation, desolate, if that's the little, if that was the little power, well, that power was being restrained by pagan Rome in Paul's days, because pagan Rome was still a power. It was a power until the 4th century, 5th century AD. It wasn't, you know, the, the papacy slowly crept its way into power. It started, it was already at work in the very beginning. That's why I said the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Why, why was it at work? Because elements of it were at work. False teachings, false gospels, false Christians. Those things were already at work. And then by the time Constantine came around in 321 AD, he made it a church-state institution. He made Christianity legal and adopted all kinds of other pagan practices into it, changed, changed the Sabbath, changed the calendar. So that began the first thing, but it was still being restrained. And then by the time in 538, we're going to cover all this more specifically, but in 538 AD, the papacy officially became the world power that it did. And if you study history for the 1260 years after that, just like the books of Daniel and Revelation say, it was trotting the saints to the ground, persecuting the saints, casting the truth to the ground. It was a dominating power. And it will be again. But that's what the Bible says. So that's the bird's eye view. But this is what the conclusion is. There's something that's restraining this mystery of iniquity from fully blooming. And that restrainer is the Roman Empire. Now, the previous episode, we saw how all these things came together in the papacy, how it profaned the gospel, it, it made the gospel desolate because it had taken over the church, right? It put itself in between God and man. The Pope was called the Vicarius Fili Dei, the Vicar of Christ, basically the, you know, presence of <laughs> the representation of God on earth. I mean, there's so much that we need to get into. I'm I'm very tempted to get into it, but I'm not going to get into this episode because the focus is this daily. But if you followed with me last episode, when the papacy was set up, that's when the abomination of desolation was set up. At the same time, the daily was taken away. Now, this you could say that this happened in 538 AD. It could have happened maybe gradually from 321 AD when the church-state union began all the way to 530 AD. The point is this. The papacy was set up the Roman Empire was replaced. It became the papacy, the, the, the Holy Roman, you know, new thing. The Byzant there was a lot of different phases. There was Byzant Byzantine Empire because the Roman Western Roman Empire collapsed. Then you had the Holy Roman Empire. But throughout this whole time, the papacy was the thing in the shadows that was controlling everything. And Rome, the Vatican, was basically the seat of power. And so you have two camps with this whole situation now. There's two conclusions that we can draw from this. Either the daily represents sacrifices. Remember, the daily means continual, regular, something that's going on continually. So either the daily represents 
the daily sacrifices that were taken away, which represent Christ's ministry being taken away. Or, pagan Rome, meaning the continual succession of empires, was taken away by the little horn. All these empires that existed before, the little horn would take it away and it would rule basically for the rest of time until Jesus would return and consume and burn this beast to the ground. So there's two camps. Again, there's the daily sacrifice. This thing could be a daily sacrifice that's taken away. But again, remember, Daniel was an Old Testament Jew. And so for him, he may have thought, oh, the daily sacrifice is going to be taken away. But he didn't realize that that meant that it was pointing to Christ's ministry. Because remember, all the sacrifices pointed to Jesus's ministry and to Jesus's atoning sacrifice, the once for all sacrifice. And so just like the sanctuary pointed to the plan of salvation, the gospel, and to Jesus, it all points to Jesus. And so these things were taken away by the little horn power and the uh, the abomination of desolation was set up. And so maybe it's talking about basically the sacrifices being taken away, which is Christ's ministry being taken away, the gospel. The other option is pagan Rome, which is again the, the continual civil rule of the previous empires. And the Vatican, we know that was ruling states that weren't its own. Right, the Vatican is this is this little power, but it controls everything without being obviously in control. If you get my drift, right? It's not like the Roman Empire was just this giant territory, and it claimed all this land for itself. The, the Vatican is a tiny little city, but yet it controls practically the whole world through various agents and schemes and, and different things. The armies aren't his own, and there's there's proof of that in in the King of the North and other things. That we'll look at. But again, there's these are the two options. So with pagan Rome, if we look at that option first, the the way that you would read Second Thessalonians is that pagan Rome was restraining the little horn power from emerging because it still had its time to do what it needed to do, namely cast judgment on Jerusalem for rejecting the Messiah, which was in 70 AD, and other things. And then they would pretty much starting in the third century, Rome started to degenerate pretty pretty rapidly. It degenerated over the course of like, you know, 200 years, but it de- started degenerating in the second or third century. But it's still, in, in Paul's time, it still had, you know, it was still in its heyday and still had things to do. And that was why the, the restrainer will be taken out of the way, which is a pagan Rome, and the little horn is going to arise and take power, just like Babylon was taken out of the way so that the Persians could arise, just like the Persians were taken out of the way so that Alexander the Great could arise, just like, you know, so on and so on and so forth. God uses empires to fulfill his purposes and his prophecies, and he casts judgment on them through other empires and means. And at the end, he's going to cast judgment on the final empire, which is the Vatican papacy beast system that's coming, and it's already in the works. Either way, the other way to look at this is the sacrifices. Now, again, the daily sacrifices, we looked at this in the abomination of desolation, just like the sanctuary, they typified Christ's work, the burn offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, uh, the free will offering and the peace offering. Maybe I'm getting these wrong, but one of those, I think I got wrong grain offering. That's the one I was looking for grain offering. So they all point to Christ in some different way. And so when when the daily sacrifices are being taken away, meaning because they're regular, the regular things, that's actually pointing to Christ's ministry being taken away, which is also true because the papacy disrupted Christ's ministry uh, through all the suppression and basically control and manipulation and false doctrines that were prevalent throughout the Dark Ages and even today. I mean, we'll get more into this in the future, but the, the papacy... If we're right about this assertion, Revelation calls this system Babylon the mother of all harlots and abominations on the earth. Well, you'll learn exactly why that title is very fitting for the papacy, because they are the mother of all abominations on the earth. Everything that's been contrary to the gospel, you can always find a Jesuit or Vatican hand behind it. But now there's an objection to this and says, well, Christ's ministry can't be taken away. 
And in some sense, this is true, right? He's reigning from heaven. That, that can't be changed. But what we're talking about here is the ministry on earth, meaning the gospel message, people entering through the door, the sanctuary being polluted of strength, robbed of power, made desolate. That's what this is talking about. Prophecies are about the earth. They're not about heaven. They're not about things that happen in heaven. And this point right here, the thing that I just said, which is that prophecies aren't about things that happen in heaven, is something we're going to come back to at the very end of this series. Because Seventh-day Adventists have a particular belief, and one of the articles I want to read to you today is actually from a Seventh-day Adventist church, because they do a good job in historical analysis. They're one of the few churches that look at things historically and that break things down from a historical lens. Nevertheless, they get one thing exceptionally wrong with Daniel's prophecies, and that's what happened in 1844 with the investigative judgment. This teaching is a blasphemous, contrary to the gospel teaching. And so if you are Adventist and if you believe this, I really hope you'll join me for the one of the final episodes of this series, and we will look at why this teaching is so wrong. But in either case, I just want to preface that because we will look at one of the articles on the Daily. That was It's a good article, but again, it's written by Adventists, and Adventists, I don't agree with everything Adventists say. They're right about the Sabbath. They're right about you know, these prophecies with, with historical fulfillment and looking at who the Antichrist power really is. A lot of Adventists have great discernment in that regard. But then, again, like any domina- denomination, there are things that are just really off, like the investigative judgment. And we'll talk more about it in the future. But, again, if responding to the objection that, oh, well, Christ's ministry can't be taken out of the way. Well, it's true. His heavenly ministry as high priest, is not going to be taken out of the way. But in, on the earth, which is what prophecies refer to, on the earth, that ministry was taken away in some sense, to some degree, because the sanctuary was made desolate by the little horn power, which is the papacy. So, I want to, before we look at some of these articles and, and highlight these, these conclusions, I want to point out some serious errors that futurists, remember futurists are people like dispensationalists, people who believe in a future Antichrist, a literal seven-year tribulation, all these literal readings of Revelation and Daniel. I want to point out some errors of futurists and preterists. Preterists who are, are people who believe that all these prophecies have already been fulfilled, meaning the Antichrist has already shown up, it's in the past, the abomination of desolation was some thing that happened with the Romans, either in 160 B.C., with Antiochus Epiphanes or with the Romans in 70 AD, all these things don't concern us, right? So these are two extremes, and they're very popular, but they set you up for major deception. If you're a preterist, then you ignore the spiritual realities happening right before your eyes, like a one-world religion, like a universal digital currency that can track your every move, i.e. great tool for Mark of the Beast enforcing. You ignore these things. And you don't think they're relevant to you. And so that sets you up for failure and deception. And you also, for a futurist now, if you look at people who are futurists, many of people who are futurists believe in a preacher of rapture, which we showed beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is not true. That is a deception. God is not going to spare the lukewarm church from tribulation when he didn't spare the first church, which was you know, arguably the the strongest in faith from persecution. So that's just a lie. But the point is, futurism also sets you up for deception because you're looking at literal physical things all the time. You're not seeing the spiritual realities that are controlling these things. And so if there is a false millennial reign that's ushered in, if there's a false Jesus, and all these fake prophecies that they are engineering with building a third temple and probably going to have that false Messiah guy walk into it and claim himself to be God. Who knows? Who really knows how they're going to do it? But they can control physical things and dangle those carrots in front of you, and then you're deceived. You think the millennial reign is here now, and Jesus is here, and it's actually Lucifer masquerading as the Son of God. My goodness, that would be something. Discernment is going to be of utmost importance in the next 10 years, 20 years. But in either case, the 
preterists and futurists, their mistake with this whole daily situation. They see this as the Jewish sacrifices, whether they're past or the future. So they say the daily sacrifice, or if you recall the ESV, it says the regular burnt offering. What is that referring to? Oh, it's referring to the Jewish sacrifices. So preterists who look at the past will say, oh, we see it's talking about the, the Jewish sacrifices were taken away and that's the Romans did that. Completely literal reading. The futurists, dispensationalists, will say, oh, it's the future sacrifices in a future third temple that's being rebuilt. So you see, both are wrong because they're looking at physical realities. They ignore the fact that this is a 2300-year prophecy. They ignore the fact the sanctuary was a type and shadow for the plan of salvation, and that's what's being trotted on for 2300 years and being cleansed. The 1260 days, the saints being persecuted is, is not literal 260 days, it's years, and it's being persecuted by the little horn power, which comes out of the fourth beast, which is the Roman Empire. These are long periods of time, kingdoms, political powers, not individuals that are walking into physical temples being rebuilt. It's really just such nonsense. So this is not just about Rome in the second century when Antiochus Epiphanes you know, destroyed and whatever, uh, vandalized the temple, set up a standard, all these different things like 70 AD, which did happen. And they were physical things that were foreshadowing greater spiritual truths. That's what we have to see. Just like the Bible has throughout history. Remember the flood, Peter compared that to baptism. Just like walking through the Red Sea, that's also parallel to baptism. The sanctuary points to Christ, the sacrifices point to Christ, all the types of Christ throughout the Old Testament, like David and Joseph and uh, Noah and Moses. It's all spiritual. God uses real people, real situations to create spiritual lessons that you can't see so that you can see them with your spiritual eyes because you understand the significance of the physical things. Do you see this? You see what I'm saying and how important it is to not get lost in just what the eyes tell you, the physical eyes. And remember that Daniel 9 is about the Messiah. We talked about that in the 70 weeks prophecy. If that's about the Messiah in 490 years, then the rest of the prophecy is read historically. Daniel 12 says it's about the end times. So it can't be this prophecy about the abomination of desolation and the little horn, all these things we're talking about, the daily being taken away, This cannot be just about Antiochus Epiphanes in 160 BC. That's not the end times. That was just a few hundred years after Daniel. And it's not about Rome in 70 AD, because that's also not the end times. That's a, I mean, comparatively, it was a pretty crazy event that happened during that time. But comparative to the millions that have been persecuted by the Catholic Church and all the evils that have happened since then, what happened in Rome in 70 AD wasn't that big of a deal, comparatively. Again, a lot of people got crucified. A lot of people were tortured, were killed. Yes, it was horrible. But by comparison to what happened after that, how the sanctuary was made desolate and the abomination of desolation was set up in a spiritual way, it doesn't even compare. These things were foreshadowing spiritual truths. And remember, the third temple was not physical never was going to be. Why would God build a third temple? Would allow the Jews to build a third temple when he destroyed the second temple? And he said that my body is the temple, the new temple, the spiritual reality. Even the Talmud, which we looked at, Yoma 39a and 39b, look it up. They documented for 40 years after, 40 years before the destruction of the temple, which is from when Jesus got crucified to um, 70 AD. Now, he got crucified in 31 AD. And remember, people counted inclusively back then. So this is another proof. I just, I love these little proofs that are even from books like the Talmud, which are very antichrist. They documented 40 years after Jesus's death. Now, they didn't say Jesus's death, but 40 years before the temple was destroyed, we know what happened 40 years before the temple was destroyed. They documented that all the signs that they were relying on for the Day of Atonement to work, where they were basically forgiven for their sins, all those signs failed every single year. 
40 years after Jesus' death on the cross. Now you tell me, is that a sign from God that he has a separate plan of salvation for the Jews? Is it really dispensationalists? It's not. It's the biggest sign from God that, hey, you messed up. You rejected my offer. Well, you're going to be destroyed. 40 years, too. I mean, you'd think that, okay, after the first year, hmm. After the first five years, hmm. After the first 10 or 15 years, well, maybe God's trying to tell us something. But you know, the Bible says many times that they were a stiff-necked people, stubborn and always lusting after their own desires. And that's true. The people who didn't convert, who created Judaism later, Judaism is a younger religion than Christianity. Christianity is the true continuation of the Bible. Judaism was set up in rebellion to Christianity. It's a rebellious religion. It is the people who were stiff-necked, who were the Pharisees, who didn't want to have a relationship with God. They wanted to do it on their own terms, like Cain. But all these things will lead you into error. So the conclusion from all this is, look, I see it as pagan Rome. And the reason is very simple. In 2 Thessalonians chapter um, 2, verse 7, let's read this in the KJV because it's better. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So there's a personification here. And this is very important. Because the ministry of Christ being taken away applies. But I think that the identifier, I think they're both true, to be honest with you. They both apply. I don't think we should be dogmatic about it. But the identifier for me that really says it's pagan Rome is the he. And remember, the beasts in Daniel were representative kingdoms and powers. Nevertheless, the beasts are personified, just like Israel was a person, but then later Israel as an individual was used to refer to the group of people, Israel. There's plenty of times in the Bible where God is speaking of the, the group of people, Israel, but he's using Israel as a person, as a singular individual. This also happens in Bible prophecy, where you have the, the beasts of Daniel are obviously kingdoms and powers, but they, they're a he, they're individuals in the, in the vision, in the prophecy. So this is the, the key thing. There's personification in this verse in Thessalonians. And to me, that personification refers to the Roman beast system, the, the fourth beast, the terrible beast, where the little horn comes out of. And the little horn, obviously, that's a person too in the vision. It's personified. But it's referring to a system, a a group of, of people, not just one individual. Now, it's represented by one individual, in this case, the, the Pope. But it's not one singular Pope. The Pope, through as an institution, the papacy, is what represents the, the little horn power. So I think this is dealing with pagan Rome. Now, the main point is this. Whether it's pagan Rome or uh, Christ's ministry being taken out of the way, either or is applicable. The point is that the papacy is what did both. Do you see the point of studying this, which most people don't study the daily? Because if you do study the meaning of this phrase and what it could possibly lead to, it leads you to the same conclusion as before. We looked at Daniel's 70 weeks. That proved that the historical understanding of time is the correct one. And all his prophecy times, all his time prophecies are to be interpreted by the day to year principle. Then we looked at the abomination of desolation and how everything is figurative. The, the, the period of time is 1290 years. So it's not talking about something physical that happened in Jerusalem in 70 AD or in, you know, 160 BC. It's talking about a long period of time where the sanctuary representative of the plan of salvation is being trodden underfoot. The saints are being persecuted by this power that comes out of the Roman system. There's no other power that meets these descriptors than the Roman Catholic Church, the institution of the papacy. And so the papacy is the one that all of this points to yet again. The daily, which could have been the regular burnt offerings that were being typified of Christ's ministry, because he's the one offering our prayers to God as the high priest. 
being taken out of the way, or pagan Rome, because it's the continual, right? The continual succession of empires was taken out of the way by the little horn power that would rule for the rest of the age in some form or another. Either way, it points to the same person. Do you see the point here? This is the point. The point is to avoid reading this as the daily sacrifice and think it's talking about some future third temple where sacrifices are being held and there's some charming dude that walks in there and proclaims himself to be God. This is the most nonsense thing that you can believe. I mean, it really is nonsense because it takes your eyes off of the true evil in this world and it'll make you easy to deceive. If the idea of a son, a false son of God will come on the earth, a false Christ, a false millennial kingdom, people who do not have discernment will get so easily fooled and will take the mark of the beast, whatever that happens to be, and worship and be completely deceived. Imagine that. I mean, that's just fascinating to me that this is a possibility in our lifetimes. But in either case, this points to the truth, which is that the papacy is the one that took the daily out of the way. Whether that daily is the ministry of Christ, because it trotted on the gospel and made it polluted the sanctuary of strength, or if it's pagan Rome, it doesn't really matter. I lean to pagan Rome. I think they're both applicable, but I lean to pagan Rome because of what I told you with personification. Now, with all that out of the way, I want to read two articles to you that are on this topic. I think they're very well written. Um, and let's pull them up. Actually, before I read them, I want to remind you that there's a link for this end times um, timeline that I've made. It's a visual timeline of all these prophecies in Daniel and Revelation. The bottom is Daniel with the statue, the beasts, uh, the 2300-year prophecy, you know, the little horn. All these things are aligned with the trumpets, the seals, um, you know, the, the woman, the two witnesses. All these things are all aligned on a graphical basically timeline and it's there for your reference. I hope that it's going to be something useful for you, but I'll put a link for that in the description for this episode. This first article is from Bible Ask. I believe they're a non-denominational whatever, uh, like a resource center. What does the Daily in Daniel 8.13 stand for? The prophet Daniel wrote, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the, gig, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? We read that. The word daily, Hebrew tamid, is mentioned 103 times in the Old Testament. The word itself does not mean daily, but simply continual or regular. In Daniel, and there's a bunch of verses here, it means continual. Of the 103 incidents, it is translated daily only, excuse me, in Numbers 4, verse 16. The word is used to portray different ideas like continual service, like in Ezekiel, continual sustenance, like in Samuel, continual sadness, continual hope, continual provocation. So it's used for a lot of different things in a way to, to, to delineate something that's ongoing. Daily is used often in re relation with the services of a sanctuary, such as the continual bread that was to be kept upon the table of showbread, the lamp that was burned continually. Remember, all these things point to Jesus. He's the light of the world. He's, he's the bread of life. The fire that was to be kept burning upon the altar, the burned offerings that were to be kept uh, to be offered daily, the incense that was to be offered morning and evening. In Daniel 8, 11, daily stands independently. In the Talmud, when tamid is used independently, it means the daily sacrifice. The translators of the KJV, who supplied the word sacrifice, noticeably thought that the daily burnt offering was the theme of this prophecy. Two views. The daily refers to paganism, in contrast with the abomination of desolation, or the papacy. Both terms point to persecuting powers. The word daily points to the continuance of the devil's opposition to the ministry of Christ through paganism. The taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination of desolation points to papal Rome replacing pagan Rome. Number two is the daily continual refers to the continuity, a uh, continual priestly ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and to the worship of Christ. 
the taking away of the daily points of the replacement of the voluntary unity of all believers in Christ by the compulsory unity of the papal church, the replacement of Christ as the head of the church by the Pope, the replacement of the direct access to Christ by all believers by the priestly hierarchy, all these things we talked about in the Abomination of Desolation episode last week, the replacement of salvation by faith in Christ by salvation through works, i.e. confessional, the mass, penance, and so on, transubstantiation, all those rat races that you run, the replacement of the mediatorial, mediatorial, mediatorial work of Christ, our great high priest in heaven, by the mediator, mediatorial work of Mary and the saints. So true, we haven't even touched on this. Mary and the saints as helping to redeem, even being co-redeemer, I mean, that's just nonsense. People pray to saints, pray to Mary. You have to stop that immediately. <laughs> This view also holds that the little horn is a symbol of imperial Rome as well as of papal Rome. Thus, the daily may also refer to the earthly temple and its services and the taking away of the daily to the desolation of the temple by the Roman legions in 70 AD and the following termination of sacrificial services. It was this feature of the abomination of desolation to which Christ referred to in his description of future events in Matthew 24, you know, Luke 21, refer referring to Daniel. While some faithful Bible students hold that the daily refers to paganism, other equally faithful Bible students hold that the daily refers to the priestly ministry of our Lord. Clearly, this is not a salvation issue and will certainly be made known as believers draw near to the end of times. So, good article. We have one more to read, but I just want to take a really quick break here and, and say this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it means because the conclusion is the point we're after. Okay. Again, I tend to lean that the daily is the continual influence of paganism, which is Rome. And it was taken away by the little horn power who set up the abomination of desolation, who also took away Christ's ministry in a sense by making the, des the uh, sanctuary desolate and, um, you know, the, the plan of salvation desolate with all the things we talked about in the abomination desolation episode. And also there's a historical physical fulfillment where the Romans took away the sacrifices in the second temple uh, in 70 AD. And of course, in 160 BC, there were some things that happened there too. But all these things, again, you have to look at things from a spiritual perspective. God, when God created prophecy, it's very clear that God created prophecy so that every generation would be able to find itself in time and understand where it is in relationship to God's word. I believe that. And I think that's the way that we should look at prophecy. We shouldn't look at prophecy as, well, all these things already happened and they don't concern us anymore, which is preterism. We don't need to worry about antichrist or anything like that. And... Or all these things will happen in a physical, literal way, and we have to pay attention to all these physical things, like the Jews do. That's also a lie, too. I think that both of these are tools by the devil to help him with his agenda of deception, to deceive you from looking at the true meaning of things, which requires spiritual eyes to see. You see the physical that happened, and you see the spiritual that it was meant to portray. And... In this case, the whole thing that happened with the Romans did portray a future reality where the beast will take control and will trot over the sanctuary, which it did for 1260 years. And it will do so again at the end of time, which we are approaching rapidly. But either way, it doesn't matter. It's not a, sal it's not a salvation issue, but it is very important for your understanding of the end times. Now, this second, ar second article... Um, again, this is from the Bible Research Institute, Seventh-day Adventist Church. I am not an Adventist. I don't agree with some of the things the Adventists teach, particularly in, with end times, the teaching of the investigative judgment. I think that is very unbiblical, and I'm going to spend a whole episode on debunking that. But this is a good article nonetheless. We can, we can take information from various sources, and if they're speaking the truth, then you know we can take so without bias. But this is written by a man named Angel, Angel Manuel Rodriguez. My friends are divided about the interpretation of the term continual in Daniel 8. Does that refer to pagan Rome or to the mediation of Christ? This is an old debate among Adventists, and it's not going away. 
What makes this particularly difficult is that at times, individuals develop conspiracy theories around it in an attempt to demonize those whose views differ from theirs. This is spiritually dangerous. I cannot deal with the history of this topic, but I will share with you my personal view of the biblical materials. Number one, usage of the term in the Bible. The Hebrew word for continual is tamid. Translators, are, translators use different terms to render it into English. As an adverb, it commonly means always, daily, continually. It's also used as a substantial, substantival adjective, that is, in conjunction with other nouns. It functions as a noun. In those cases, we find, for instance, the following translations. Continuance, unceasing, daily, and regular. Daniel used it, used it as a noun with the article in Daniel 8.11. In general, we could say that to me designates what happens continuously or at regular intervals or in perpetuity. So it's something that it talks about a regularly happening thing that just goes on and is consistent, which could be the mediation of Christ represented by the sacrifices or the influence of pagan Rome and paganism in general. Use in number two, use in the context of the sanctuary. Most of the usages of the term are found in relation to the sanctuary services and the role of the priest as mediator. Aaron was always continually to wear the breastpiece and the plate of gold attached to his turban. He was to keep the fire burning on the altar, altar continuously, keep the bread of presence before the Lord regularly, burn incense daily, and keep the lamps burning. Tamid is also used to refer to the daily burnt and cereal offerings, and those activities were performed by the priests on a daily and regular basis. A summary of those services is found in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 37. And he goes on to describe the summary. Number three, Tamid and Daniel. First, in the case of Daniel, Tamid has an article and should probably be translated as the continuance. Most Bible translators find translations find in the terms an abbreviated reference to the daily sacrifice. Such rendering is arbitrary because in the context of the sanctuary, the term is employed in connection with a multiplicity of priestly activities, not exclusively one of them. So in, in when it's used, when the daily tamid is used in context, it's always in, used in context of something specific, not just one thing like the sacrifices. So the idea that putting the sacrifice Adding the word sacrifice, even though it seems like it's based on historically accurate things, may not have been the best translation. Maybe it's arbitrary. Second, the tamid is directly connected to the word of the prince of the heavenly hosts, as in verse 11. As we noted, the term is primarily related to the sanctuary services performed by the priest. In Daniel, and the prince is a heavenly high priest performing a work of mediation. It is to the same activity the Hebrews refer when it states that Jesus always lives to intercede for them. So Hebrews is making an appeal to this continual intercession of Christ. Third, the Hebrew verb translated to take, rum, means be high, arise, exalt, be removed, lift up. The verbal form used in Daniel 8.11 means be removed, exalted. The meaning of the verb in Daniel can be further defined by the preposition used with it, the continual is removed from, and in quotations, it's removed from. Whenever the verb room is accompanied by that preposition, it always expresses the idea of separation. Something is removed from someone or something. At times, removing or separating someone from others results in exaltation. But the fundamental idea of the verb continues to be that of removing from. Only the context will indicate whether the idea of exaltation is also present. The little horn removed the continual from the prince by, by usurping his priestly work. The conflict described in this text is between Christ and the little horn, not between the two phases of Rome. The tamid is never used in the Old Testament to refer to a pagan system of religious mediation. It describes the work of the priest on behalf of God's people it is therefore contextually and linguistically inappropriate to apply it to pagan Rome. So, you can see in these two articles, there's two perspectives that are very well documented. And reading through them, it's like, oh gosh, you know, I, I believe that now. You know, they both, to me, they both are true. I think they're both true. I believe because of the Second Thessalonians passage, he 
refers to the beast that's restraining the final system, which is the little horn power. So that's why I lean to pagan Rome. But the second article that we read makes very good points, and I think they're all on point. I think they are both true. Both of these theories are true. And the point of all this is, again, that it's not about whether you believe it's Christ mediation or the pagan Rome. This is, it's meaningless. The real point is both of these are true and they both point to the same power. You see the point? They both show and reveal the papacy as the power that trotted on the saints that set up the abomination of desolation, that proclaimed itself to be God, that did all these things. That is the power that Christ will destroy when he returns, because by that point, that power will be in full swing. Revelation 17 talks about a woman riding a beast as the final system. And that means that there's a woman, which is an apostate church, the prostitute. A woman's always represented a church and the beast, which is a political system. The beast in Revelation is identical to the beast described by Daniel. I mean, they're very similar. And so what do you make of that? Well, the, ro the woman in Revelation 17 sits on seven hills. Rome is the only place with seven hills. And that's a political union of church and state, which is coming. So all these things we will unpack in future episodes this episode is more about putting another nail in the coffin of dispensationalism and futurism and preterism, all these false ways of reading Bible prophecy, again, because they lead you to being deceived. If you're really methodical and careful, as we have been so far with the Daniel 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation last week, and this week, the daily, it all keeps pointing to the same thing. And so I hope this has been a blessing for you. I hope this has been something new. Not too many people talk about the daily. Again, we had some Adventist sources. Adventists are one of the few people that discuss these things. They look at these things from a historical lens. I do not agree with everything Adventists have to say. That's not the point of this presentation. But the point is that history has testified who the Antichrist power is. And if you understand that, then you will know what to look for, what to see, and you will have spiritual eyes to discern whether something is good or not, because otherwise you'll be distracted and you'll think that Bible prophecy is going to come true, or I should say that that is coming true when it's actually being engineered. This whole third temple being built is a deception. The false messiah is a deception. It's a dialectic. It's a problem-reaction-solution to bring about a new world system a world peace, a light world order, a church-state union where everybody is bowing down to the beast and possibly even a false Christ. All of this and more we will get into in future episodes. A lot to talk about. But either way, I hope this has been a blessing for you. And take care and not be deceived. We'll see you next time. Be healthy, be safe, and love you very much. God bless. <music>